Force One. <laughs> I happen to have been in Air Force One on his last trip as a member of the staff, and I talk about this in detail in my book. Um, the president asked him to say a few words, and here I thought, this is Karl Rove's farewell speech in Air Force One. This is the architect of the Bush administration, a longtime friend of the Bush family. This is going to be something memorable, and he's a colorful character, of course. He gets up. He looks around the room. We're all with bated breath waiting for his words, except for Mrs. Bush, who's sort of flipping through the newspaper as he's preparing to speak. And he looks over at Kevin Sullivan, the communications director, and Kevin was eating some cake, and he says, Kevin, you're the mayor of control. And then there was complete silence. No one had any idea what he was talking about, including Kevin, who was still chewing the cake in his mouth, and suddenly everybody's staring at him. I guess he was saying, Kevin, you, it's now your turn to take over? Well, what he was saying was uh, there was a – in the motorcades, presidential motorcades, there was a vehicle called the control vehicle. And Carl was typically assigned to the control vehicle. And as Carl, being Carl, had dubbed himself the mayor of control. Uh, so he's handing over the keys. Correct. You start the book by describing being briefed on the collapse of the American economy last fall by Keith Hennessy, yep. the director of the National Economic Council. Do you have any idea why one of the top economic advisors in the White House decided to put, put on Mickey Mouse ears as he was briefing you? I really don't have an explanation for that. No explanation was offered. We just sort of watched it and in wonder and sort of thought it was a metaphor for what was happening. And hadn't you been asked to write a speech that said the opposite of what the federal government was actually doing? Right. We were given the impression, and the president was given the impression, that we were doing something different with these mortgage-backed securities, these toxic access assets, than we actually were going to do. And so we wrote the speech saying that, and then it turned out the Treasury Department said what the president thought we were doing, we weren't doing. And the president was caught by surprise about this as well. So he'd given the speech. He had no idea what he was that it, what he was saying. Well, he had been talking about this proposal, which he called, you know, we were going to buy these assets low and then sell them high at a profit for the taxpayer. And it sounded like a good idea to me. But it turned out what the Treasury Secretary wanted to do was actually buy them high and maybe sell them low at a loss to the government just to get the economy going. Was he cracking under the pressure? The president? Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't say that, no. Uh, I mean, it was a very difficult situation. And I, I remember thinking, you know, how many more of these crises can any president go through? Because there are times in the book when you seem to be confirming some of the worst suspicions about the Bush administration and the federal government. Uh, was that what you were hoping to do? Um, there are many things that are alarming about the federal government. And I, one of the things I was hoping to do was to, in a, in a way that's not a screed, try to show people what I saw in these different levels of government so they can see in a lot of ways this system, and this is no surprise to any of your listeners, is broken. Did, so you walked away disillusioned? I did. Um, you know, I and, I and I can speak for liberals and conservatives that I know. We all champion people who say they support our values, our beliefs, our principles, whatever they are, when they get elected. And then they go to Washington, and most of them forget why they came there. I mean, you know, we, I mentioned in my book a senator who had somebody who carried her purse around. And, you know, um, other senators get chauffeur-driven everywhere. They have free lunches, several offices in one building. Uh, you forget why you get elected. And I think there's a frustration on both sides of the aisle about that. You said that speechwriters all uh, read Barack Obama's speeches. Uh, during the debates, it became apparent that John McCain thought he was a lightweight. What did uh, the president think about Barack Obama? Well, the only thing I know about the president thought about it was after the, uh, uh, Senator Obama gave his convention speech, I believe that's when it was, President Bush came into the family theater where we were practicing his speech to the Republican National Convention. And he was ticked off. And he came in and he looked at us and he said, um, and I say this in my book, uh, something to the effect of, uh, I don't have it in front of me, but something to the effect of, you know, this cat doesn't know, isn't remotely qualified for this job, and um, people don't think I'm qualified, he said to myself. Well, well I was qualified. And he, 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 was a, he was a very human reaction. He was annoyed by what Obama was saying. I, of course, he was on the opposite party. He's running for president. You'd assume that he would be critical of, right. of the administration that he was running against. Uh, I would imagine that some of your former colleagues have been upset by the way they've been portrayed. Uh, do you think you'll ever be asked to work in Washington again? Well, you know, I really don't want to work in a situation like I've been in in Washington again. So that's, you know, I, I tried to write a what I wanted to do is, you know, many people across the country, when I've ever met them, you know, friends of mine or, or relatives, have always asked me, you know, what's it really like 
to work on Capitol Hill or the Senate or the Pentagon or the White House. And I wanted to tell them what it was really like. Even if you upset some people, your former boss, William McGurn, who once called you a star, had an op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal that attacked your book. He did. Uh, were you surprised? I was surprised that Bill did that because many of the things he said were already being debunked as just not true. But the situation is, you know, there are a lot of people who were in the Bush administration, a small, well, a small group of people actually, who had a lot of power and they wanted the power badly. They often used it badly. And now they're out of power and they don't like it. And they don't like other people who were not in their club having different views. One of the uh, the things that becomes apparent uh, throughout this book, one of the themes, is that uh, there is often a gap between the way staffers see the world and the way the people they work for see the world. Right. And and that seems to be uh, something that's a gap that's hard to bridge. Yes. And, you know, I think one of the benefits of my book is, you know, I'm not – I didn't have a vested interest in perpetuating George Bush's legacy. I didn't hate him. I didn't drink the Kool-Aid, though. I saw him as a speechwriter. Speechwriter is an observer by nature. You have to be. And there's a wonderful history of writers and presidential aides who have written books about their times in administrations and their conversations with presidents. And you get a special window as a speechwriter. So I think it makes it a little bit more credible what I saw. Just one more thing. A listener wants to know what the opinion of Sarah Palin was inside the White House during the campaign. That was very interesting. Um, many people, as soon as Sarah Palin was announced, became euphoric based on little information about her. All I knew, she was a conservative governor of Alaska and a woman. Um, and, but I, I wanted to sort of wait and see what I thought about her as a choice because she was unknown on the national stage. But you weren't allowed that luxury in the White House. If you, if you didn't enthusiastically support her, there were the people crowded around you and got angry. And luckily for me, because I wasn't quite sure what I thought of her, President Bush came to the rescue and said pretty much what many people were thinking, which is, you know, he first he, he came in and he joked, you know, I don't know if I've ever met her. What is she, the governor of Guam? <laughs> but it was a joke. He knew where she was coming from. But he said, you know, he wouldn't let it, as he sometimes did, he would go on on something and then he'd come back to this. And he said, you know, this woman is and her family aren't remotely qualified or remotely prepared for what they're about to get into. The the thrust of the media spotlight, no one's prepared them for this. And he said, let's see in a few weeks if the bloom is off the rose. And I think it was a very wise assessment. Matt Latimer's book, Speechless, Tales of a White House Survivor, is published by Crown. Thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, thank you for having me. I very much enjoyed it. 